Welcome back everyone to MA 170. This is lecture 15 in week number nine. Today, we're gonna to take a look at something we've already encountered that is phase lead or lag compensators, but this time we're gonna see their design from a different point of view, that is in the frequency domain. We've already seen how to design them using a root locus approach. And now we're gonna do something similar, but from a Bode plot approach, in particular, we're going to exploit the knowledge about the stability margins, gain margin, and phase margins. Today, we're going to go through the description of the phase lead and lag compensators in the frequency domain, and then we're going to see the design for the phase lead compensator. Then next time, we're going to finish uh, taking a look at how to design phase lag compensators. All right, so as usual, let's start by considering our unity feedback loop system with our plant transfer function. And we're gonna place as usual, our compensator to the left of it. And the compensator this time, we're gonna write it as K times S plus Sigma Z over S plus Sigma P, where K is a positive real number. Depending on the values of sigma z and sigma p, we can either have a lead compensator, and that happens when in the S plane, the real zero is to the right of the real pole. That is, we can have the following com uh, configuration. So the magnitude of the pole is greater than the magnitude of the zero because both of them are going to be on the um, left-hand side of the complex plane anyway. And we have that alpha, which we've defined as the ratio between sigma p and sigma z, well, that is greater than one. On the other hand, if the real pole is to the right of the real zero, that is, if the magnitude of the real pole is less than the magnitude of the real zero, alpha is going to be less than one. And thus, we're gonna take a look at a lag compensator. Now, throughout this lecture, I'm going to use the usual uh, split between the right and the left, so to the left we're going to have the lead compensators and to the right the lag compensators and when i'm not going to have the um, dividing line well it means that what's written is valid for both in fact now the general transfer function written in this form is valid for both lead or lag compensator so now we're going to consider them from the frequency domain perspective. And we've seen that when we're studying systems uh, from the frequency domain perspective, it really makes sense to substitute or to perform the substitution as equal I omega. So we can rewrite such compensators just in the frequency domain. So they're going to be a function instead of the complex variable s, just of the real variable omega. All right, now just performing some editing here. which I'm sure you can follow pretty easily, we can rewrite the transfer function in the canonical form ready for the body plot. And uh, before going to the last step, I'm going to define the following. I'm going to define tau as one over sigma p. And this is to be consistent with your textbook. As a matter of fact, what I'm talking about is in chapter 10 of your textbook. It's going to be um, 
chapter 10.1 through 10.5, you're gonna find the details in the syllabus and or on Canvas. All right, so tau is gonna be equal to one over sigma p and alpha tau is going to be one over sigma z. And remember obviously that alpha is sigma p over sigma z. So with those substitutions in mind, then our transfer function is going to be equal to k over alpha times one plus alpha tau omega i over one plus tau omega i. Again, this is valid for both lead and lead compensators. Let's just take a look at the limits of this transfer functions for, you know, the limit values for our variable. What is our variable? It is our frequency. So the two limits are going to be, well, omega that tends to zero and omega that tends to infinity. So for the former one, we have that the limit for omega that tends to zero of k over alpha times one plus alpha tau omega i over one plus tau omega i. Well, if omega tends to zero, we're left with k over alpha. So we have a constant. So what is the magnitude of k over alpha? Well, since both k and alpha are positive, that is just equal to k over alpha itself. And what is the phase or the angle associated with a positive number? Well, that is zero degrees. Now let's take the limit for omega that tends to infinity. So when omega tends to infinity, what you have to do is you have to gather or collect the variable that tends to infinity, in this case, omega. So that will multiply one over omega plus alpha tau i over omega that multiplies one over omega plus tau i. Omega and omega cancel out. One over omega tends to zero if omega tends to infinity. So we are left with k. Once again, what is the magnitude of k? It's k itself because k is positive and the, the phase associated with a positive real number is once again, zero. So for both lead and lag compensators, we have that the low frequency values. So when I'm talking about low frequency values, I'm talking about the transfer function for when the frequency tends to zero and high frequencies, of course, when omega tends to infinity. So we have that the phase associated with this transfer function for both low and high frequencies is zero, whereas the magnitude is different. We have a gain of k over alpha for low frequencies and of k at high frequencies. Now in this course, so pretty much in this lecture and in the next, we're going to consider compensators that do not modify the steady state error. I know that we saw when we designed the lead compensators and the lag compensators in the root locus, that in general, the compensators modify the steady state error. The lead compensator will increase the steady state error, whereas the lag compensator will decrease the steady state error. As a matter of fact, that was exactly the purpose for the design of a, a phase lag compensator in the root locus. It was purposely to decrease the steady state error. However, if we choose the value of k properly, then we're gonna have, we can have a compensator, whether it is a lead compensator or a lag compensator that does not 
interfere with the steady stateness of the system. So for instance, the steady state error will not change. And we're gonna have that if the gain at low frequencies, that is for omega that tends to zero, well, that is, if that is equal to zero decibels. So we don't have any positive or negative contribution given by the compensator itself. So how do we find that? Well, let's compute 20 logarithm of the magnitude of the compensator when omega tends to zero. Well, we've already found what the limit of omega for omega that tends to zero of GC of I omega is, and that was K over alpha. So now we want 20 logarithm in base 10 of K over alpha, which is also 20 logarithm of K over alpha to be equal to zero decibel. So for a logarithm to be equal to zero, it means that its argument has to be equal to one. Therefore, k over alpha has to be equal to one, which implies that k has to be equal to alpha. Once again, we're gonna focus on this particular kind of compensators because we don't want to uh, mess with the steady state error. In fact, the design in the frequency domain for lead or lag compensators will not focus on the steady state error at all. So when we introduce a lead compensator or a lag compensator designed in the frequency domain that is using body plots, we don't want it to interfere with the steady state performance of the system. So we must choose k equals alpha right here. So let's rewrite the transfer function of these uh, lead or lag compensators of particular with k equals alpha. So we're gonna have alpha times s plus sigma z over s plus sigma p. So this is using the S variable, if we wanted to use the frequency domain, so the omega variable, that this will be equal to one plus I alpha tau omega over one plus I tau omega. Remember that in front, there used to be K over alpha, but being K equals to alpha, then alpha over alpha is equal to one. And once again, let me remind you that sigma p is equal to one over tau, sigma z is equal to one over alpha tau, and alpha is the ratio of sigma p over sigma z. Now let's show through an example that this is in fact the case. So let's show that a lead or a lag compensator written as we did, that is with k equals to alpha, will not alter the uncompensated system steady state error. So in order to show that, let's uh, consider a type one system. So we're gonna have our plant with the numerator and then S times a denominator. So it's clear that we have one pole at the origin. So this is a type one. And remember, in order to have a finite steady state error associated with the type one system, we must be dealing with a ramp type of input. So our input is one over S squared. All right, so block diagram of our uncompensated system. We don't have compensator, we simply close the loop on the plant that we have. So what is the steady state error for the uncompensated system? This, this is just a review of what we have done so many times. So I'm going to go a little bit faster.
All right, here we are ready to compute the limit, which we already knew it was going to be equal to the denominator evaluated at s equals zero over the numerator evaluated at s equals zero, which is also equal to our velocity constant. Now let's take a look at our compensated system. But again, we have to consider the compensator as alpha times s plus sigma z over s plus sigma p. We can also rewrite this as alpha times s plus one over alpha tau over s plus one over tau or one plus alpha tau s over one plus tau s. Now we're ready to find the steady state error for the compensated system. Okay, so once again, we have the limit for s that goes to zero of s times e of s. What is e of s is the input times one over one plus our loop function. So our loop function is gc times g. So here it's just a little bit more lengthy, but the concept is really the same. It's just to, again, show whether or not the compensator that we've, cho that we've chosen does the trick of maintaining the steady state error of the uncompensated system unaltered. So here, if you substitute s equals zero, then this will go away, this will go away, this will go away. So once again, we have d evaluated at zero over n evaluated at zero, which means that the steady state error of the uncompensated system is equal to the steady state error of the compensated system. All right, so this is valid if and only if you choose a compensator with this structure. That is, it, it is pre-multiplied by a gain that is equal to alpha, where alpha is the ratio between sigma p over sigma z. Any other value of alpha will, will make the steady state error either higher or lower. Now, the next thing that we're gonna see before taking a look at the actual design is how do the phase lead and lag compensators look like in the frequency domain? That is, what are their body plots? Let's take a look. So of course, we're gonna choose the version of the compensators with the frequency because that is what we need to draw the body plots. And I am going to do one extra thing here. I am going to write it as one plus omega over omega z times i over one plus omega over omega p times i. So here, omega z is equal to sigma z and omega p is equal to sigma p. So sigma z or omega z is the frequency of the real zero, whereas omega p is the frequency of the real pole of the compensator. All right, so for a lead compensator, we have that since alpha is greater than one, we have that the frequency of the zero is less than the frequency of the pole. Here, I'll just show you a trick to remember. It is kind of the opposite from what we saw in the S plane, because in the S plane, remember we had that the zero is closer to, or it is to the right of the pole. But in the body plot, where our 
x-axis is the frequency, we have that the frequency associated with the zero is to the left of the frequency associated with the pole. And I'm still, I'm here I'm, I'm referring to the phase lead compensator, okay? So I'm just still on the left-hand side. Um, remember that the natural frequency was the distance of a certain pole from the origin. So if we apply that concept, you see that the frequency, the distance from the real zero to the origin is smaller than the distance from the pole to the origin. That's why omega z is to the left with respect to omega p. Again, you have to sort of reverse the order when you're, if you go from the S plane to the Bode plot conceptually, omega z will come before omega p. All right, so as usual, what we do, we find the cutoff frequencies associated with the compensator. So the cutoff frequencies are omega z and omega p. Omega z comes before omega p. So let's draw the contribution of the real zero and the real pole. We have the contribution magnitude wise of the real pole. And I've already drawn this. It's going to be zero all the way up to the cutoff frequency. And then we start departing, increasing with the slope of plus 20 decibels per decade means that every time we multiply the frequency by 10, we increase the magnitude by 20 decibels. What about the contribution of the pole? That's gonna be zero decibel until the cutoff frequency associated with the pole, and then with the part downwards with the negative constant slope of minus 20 decibels per decade. So if we put things together, we can draw first the asymptotic plot. So we have to sum up the contribution of the two. There's a superposition after all. So we have zero until omega z, then between omega z and omega p, the only con non-zero contribution is going to be the one due to the zero. And then once we reach omega p, then the contribution due to the zero will cancel out with the contribution due to the pole because we have plus and minus 20 decibels per decade. So we're gonna go back to a flat line like so. And of course you can always draw the actual plot by just making it smoother. Like so. And we have that in the middle where the asymptotic plot coincides with the actual plot that happens at a frequency that we're going to call omega m. And um, well, we're going to see it in a, in a few seconds. Let's now take a look at what happens for the phase lag compensator. Well, now the frequency associated with the pole happens to be smaller than the frequency associated with the zero. So the contribution of the pole comes before. So what happens is that you have pretty much the same body plot, but flipped with respect to the real axis and not the real axis, but the frequency axis. So now we're gonna have a body plot magnitude wise. That looks like this. And once again, 
the middle, in the middle between omega p and omega z, we have omega m. Now, what does it mean that that is in the middle? Remember that we're using a logarithmic scale when it comes to the frequency. So the middle is not the, the average. Omega m is not the average between omega z and omega p. However, it is still a mean, but it's the geometric mean between omega z and omega p. Do you remember how to compute the geometric mean? That is equal to the square root of omega z times omega p. And we can also use the fact that omega p is equal to one over tau and omega z is one over alpha tau. And so we can write omega m as one over tau times square root of alpha. One thing to notice is that, let's take a look now at the phase lead compensators. We're gonna leave towards the high frequencies with the, the magnitude that is different than zero. And in particular, it, it is positive. So it's gonna be a constant value equal to 20 logarithm of alpha. 20 logarithm of alpha. And since alpha is greater than one, logarithm of something that is greater than one is a positive number. So that's why we are in the positive side of the decibel. Opposite things happen for the phase lag compensator because now 20 logarithm of alpha being alpha less than one is going to be a negative number. So we're gonna have a high frequency gain that is the magnitude associated with high values of the frequency is a negative number. All right, so these are the two body plots for the magnitude. Now let's take a look at the body plots for the phase. And once again, let's start with the phase lead compensator and let's draw first the contribution of the zero, of the real zero. So what you have to do, you have to center, you have to find obviously the cutoff frequency associated with the zero, go one decade before, that is at omega z over 10, and one decade after at, so 10 times omega z. What you have to do is you have to draw a line that is zero all the way to one decade before the cutoff frequency, and then it increases linearly all the way to one decade after the cutoff frequency, that is 10 times omega z, and then it maintains itself constant and at a value of plus 90 degrees. Similarly, we can draw the contribution for the real pole. Once we've drawn or we yeah, we found the value of the cutoff frequency associated with the real pole. We go one decade before, which is here at omega p over 10, and one decade after at 10 omega p. And we do the same. We go maintain zero degrees all the way to one decade before, and then we decrease linearly until we hit minus 90 at one decade after the cutoff frequency and then we keep it constant. Now, if we want to draw the contribution of the entire compensator, so we have to superimpose the phase. So the phase is gonna be zero until one decade before the zero. And then it starts increasing because now we have a positive contribution due to the zero until one decade before the pole. And then we have 
a plateau until we descend once again, till we hit one decade after the cutoff frequency of the pole, and then we return to zero. This is the asymptotic plot. Of course, we can draw the real plot. And it's gonna look something like this. So you see that we have a bump, a bump-like body plot. And if you remember, the phase lead compensator, as I said a few lectures ago, would add phase. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're adding phase through a range of frequencies. So we're not adding the same phase for this, throughout all the frequencies, but we're adding a bump-like uh, distribution of phase throughout a, a certain range of frequencies. In particular, we're going to add, we're going to be adding a maximum in terms of phase corresponding to that omega m frequency. So at omega m, we're going to add the maximum amount of phase. And this amount of phase is going to be positive. Now, if we repeat the same reasoning for the phase lag compensator, you'll see that we're going to find a bump, but in the negative sense. So using a lag compensator, we are going to subtract phase throughout a range of frequencies, and we're going to have a minimum or the maximum amount of phase that we're going to subtract occurs once again at that omega m frequency. What is the value of this maximum phase that we are either adding or subtracting? There's a very uh, nice formula for that. And that is given by arc sine or sine to the minus one, minus one indicating the inverse function. So arc sine of alpha minus one over alpha plus one. So Vm is gonna be positive for a lead compensator and negative for a lag compensator. Now we can use the characteristics of these lead and leg compensator to meet the requirements of an uncompensated system that might not meet the requirements. So using the compensator, we can do so by modifying, by bending the body plot using the compensator. So you see that we're gonna modify it in terms of phase, if we are using a lead compensator, we can add some phase. Let's say, for instance, that we have a requirement in terms of phase margin. We don't have enough phase margin in our uncompensated system. We can add some phase using a lead compensator. We can also sub subtract some phase using a lead compensator. Usually, you don't really want to subtract phase. You want to have as big of a gain uh, phase margin uh, as you possibly can have. So you normally use a lead compensator if you want to increase your phase margin actively. We're gonna see that. But keep in mind that although you're adding some phase, what happens is that you're also adding some high frequency gain. The low frequency gain has been designed to be zero, so we don't interfere with the steady state error. Steady state, you always have to draw the parallel, so steady state is equivalent to s equals zero or omega equals zero, tending to zero, that tends to zero. All right, so on the other hand, when we're talking about the phase lag compensator, we're going to remove 
some high, uh, high frequency gain. And we're also going to remove some phase For a range of frequencies. We're going to see that we can use either a lead compensator or a lag compensator with the body plot, so in the frequency domain, to reach the same objective. And that's exactly what we're going to do between today and next time. We're going to solve the same problem, but designing two different kinds of compensators. And once again, why do we want to do that? Well, that is because we might have some requirements that we want to meet. We did the same for the root locus approach, and we're going to do the same for the body plot approach. Now, we, when we are in the frequency domain, usually the requirements are expressed in terms of phase margin or gain margin or crossover frequency or bandwidth or simply the DC gain, the zero frequency gain, or the steady state error. Again, the, the last two should not really involve a compensator in the frequency domain because, well, that's not going to have any effect on that. So we have to take care of the requirements in terms of steady state error in another way, as we will see shortly. Uh, now, here, a quick thing before going to the actual design of the phase lead compensator. When you're drawing the body plot, when you, you want to take a look at the phase margin or the gain margin, you want to always draw the uh, body plot for the loop transfer function. So if you don't have a compensator, that's your loop transfer function is your k times g of s. Let's say you have a gain that you can modify or simply G of S. And if you have a compensator also concatenated, then it's going to be your L of S, that is K times GC times G. That's exactly what we did for the root locus as well. And I saw some mistakes in the last homework because some people drew the root locus for the closed loop system. But what you're plotting is the root locus for the, op the loop system. So same thing has to happen here. When you're drawing the body plot, it has to be for the loop transfer function. And why is that? Because all these methodologies, all these techniques that I'm teaching you, the goal is to get information about the closed loop system without having to actually compute the transfer function of the closed loop system. So we want to get as much information as possible about the closed loop system using the loop system. So what we know, and what we know is the plant transfer function and the compensator or controller that we're designing. So we can draw the body plot for that transfer function or the root locus for that transfer function. And we're going to find, or we're going to learn something about the closed loop system. All right. With that being said, let's proceed with the design of a phase lead compensator using the frequency domain approach. And we're going to do that as we've done it for the root locus, that is using an example. There's not really a unique way of designing compensators. So I'll, I'll just show you an example. And then you might have to, to modify your approach depending on the requirements and on the objectives of your problem. But this is gonna be general enough. All right, without further ado, let's consider the following plant transfer function. We're gonna have five over S times S plus five. So type one system, no zeros, two poles, one at the origin and one at minus five. And we're gonna have two requirements. First requirement is in terms of the steady state error that has to be less or equal to 0 0.02 for a ramp input. 
once again, it, it was pretty obvious that we had to refer to a ramp input because the system type is one. So we're going to have a finite steady state error if and only if the input is a ramp type of input. Furthermore, the other requirement, and that's going to be the interesting part, is that the phase margin has to be greater than 48 degrees. Now, as I said previously, with this kind of compensators that we're considering in the frequency domain, there's nothing that we can do about the steady state error using the compensators. So we have to find a way to, to fix the steady state error otherwise. This can be done very easily by simply choosing a constant gain that is high enough to lower the steady state error. So if we concatenate a gain k in series with our plant transfer function, we can find the steady state uncompensated error as a function of k, and we can find a value of k that will, uh, that will meet the requirements in terms of steady state error. So computing the steady state error, and I think you might be sick and tired of doing this, but it's always a good exercise. The usual limit for s that goes to zero of s times s one over s squared. And so we have s times s plus five over s times s plus five plus five k. So if s goes to zero, we are left with five over five k, that is one over k. So this has to be less or equal than 0 0.02, or in other words, k has to be greater or equal to 50. Now let's be, um, let's just pick k equal to 50. So let's allow the maximum amount of steady state error. So we're gonna modify, in other words, our plant, including this, constant gain that takes care of the steady state error requirements. So now we know that our uncompensated system, just having this gain equals to 50, will meet the requirements in terms of steady state error. But we have the other uh, requirement, and that is the phase margin. So is the phase margin or the uncompensated system greater than 48 degrees. Well, if that is the case, we don't even need to design a compensator at all. But if, if the phase margin is lower than 48 degrees, well, then we have to, or we can introduce a compensator. And that's exactly one of the objectives. So obviously we're gonna find a phase margin less than 48, but let's uh, do that. And before actually calculating the phase margin, let's draw the Bode plot for the uncompensated system. So it's always good because it will make us visualize um, what the phase margin is and what we can do to the system. This is gonna be useful even later because we're gonna uh, try to design or to make the, the system meet the requirements in terms of phase margin using a lag compensator, but that's going to be next time. So this time we're going to focus on the lead compensator. But once again, before doing that, let's draw the body plot for the uncompensated system. So the uncompensated system, since we want the body plot, we need the usual substitution s equal i omega. And so we have 50 times 5 over I omega times I omega plus five. We don't really have this transfer function in the canonical form ready for 
uh, the body plot. So we have to modify it. And uh, well, here I skipped a step, but I invite you to verify that this is indeed what happens. So we have 50 over I omega times one plus 0 0.2 I omega. So we have three contributions. We have a constant gain equals to 50. So when it comes to decibels, 20 logarithm of 50 is equal to 34 decibels. And we have a pole at the origin, we already knew that. And a real pole, we already also knew that, that, that pole is situated at minus five, or in terms of the time constant associated with that, that is equal to 0 0.2 seconds. Or the cutoff frequency is tau to the minus one, so it's five radians per second. This is also equal to our omega. No, it's okay, I'll just leave it like this. All right, so now let's draw the contribution first in terms of magnitude and then in terms of phase for these three uh, factors. Let's start with the constant gain. So this is also a good exercise for the drawing of the root locus. So the contribution here, it is constant throughout the spectrum of frequencies. And that is all when it comes to the phase. Well, the phase associated with the positive number is zero. So this is gonna be just a new, a null contribution. Pretty uh, straightforward there. Now we have the contribution due to the pole at the origin. So in terms of magnitude, that's going to be a descending straight line that passes through zero decibels in correspondence to one radian per second. Here we go. And when we're considering the phase, well, we have a constant phase equal to minus one throughout the spectrum of frequencies. Oops. All right, finally, we have the contribution of the real pole. So when it comes to the magnitude, we have, well, what is the cutoff frequency of the pole? It was five radians per second. So the magnitude is gonna be equal to zero all the way to five. And then it will start going down with the constant slope of minus 20 decibels per decade. There we go. What about, oh, something happened here. All right. What about the phase contribution of the real pole? Well, we have to, once again, draw the cutoff frequency and then one decade before and one decade after. So keep these three points in mind. And then the contribution is going to be zero all the way to one decade before. And then we go down to minus 90 in correspondence to one decade after. And then we stay at minus 90. All right, now we have to sum all the contributions up. So starting from the magnitude, now between zero and one, we have well, the constant magnitude of the gain plus 
the decrease in magnitude, which is still non-zero due to the pole at the origin. So what happens with the two is that we're going to transpose the blue line upwards by a constant value of 34 decibels. So in other words, we're going to have that in correspondence to one radian per second, we're going to intersect the 34 decibel line. Right here, I already have the points ready. But, you know, you, you'll be given um, a much nicer sheet to draw your body plots for the exam. So you shouldn't have problems with, with figuring it out. All right, so this is all the way to five. Then you see that after five radians per second, we also have the contribution of the real pole. So now the slope from minus 20 decibels per decade goes down to minus 40 decibels per decade. Okay, so I'm gonna have a dashed line because this is just the asymptotic body plot. And we can do the same for the phase. For the phase, it's even easier. So we have all the way to 0 0.5, the phase is gonna be equal to minus 90 because we, that's the only non-zero contribution. And then it will go down linearly to minus 180 or omega equals 50. And then it's gonna be equal to minus 180 all the way. And once again, this is just the asymptotic plot. So I'm gonna make it into a dashed line. If we want the real uncompensated body plot, well, then it's gonna look something like this. For the magnitude and for the phase. There we go. So already graphically, we can take a look at the crossover frequency and the phase margin. Remember that the crossover frequency is the frequency at which the magnitude plot intersects the zero decibel line. And this happens right here. So at some point that is greater than 10, so between 10 and 50 radians per second. So if we go all the way to the phase plot and we measure the distance between the actual plot and the minus 180 degrees line, that is our phase margin. is our uncompensated phase margin. So already graphically, we can tell, assuming that we did our drawing accurately enough, that this phase margin is definitely less than 48 degrees because the distance between these two line is 90. So a half is 45. So the phase margin should be about this distance and it is definitely not. So we need to 
introduce a compensator to make up for the lack of phase margin. However, let's see the actual value for the phase margin. So another exercise, what is the phase margin? Phase margin is the phase of our system, our uncompensated system, evaluated at the crossover frequency. So for I omega C plus 180 degrees. And what is the crossover frequency? The crossover frequency is the frequency such that the body plot of the magnitude intersects the zero decibel lines, or in other words, 20 logarithm of the magnitude of G is equal to zero. So let's, we have to compute the crossover frequency first. That's, that is what you want to do. But we have 20 logarithm of, so we have the magnitude, what is our transfer function is 50 over I omega times one plus 0 0.2 I omega. This has to be equal to zero. And as I said, logarithm of something is equal to zero if that something, that is the argument, is equal to one. So we want that the magnitude or the absolute value of 50 over I omega times one plus 0 0.2 I omega be equal to one. All right, so what is the magnitude of this complex number? Numerator, simply 50. Denominator, we have the first factor, I omega. Its magnitude is simply omega. And then we have the magnitude of the second factor, real part, just one squared, plus imaginary part, 0 0.2 omega squared. So we have 0 0.04 omega squared equals one. And so we can go a little bit faster here. You can see that we are left with the fourth order equation, but it's a bi-quadratic equation because it's missing the cubed and the linear terms. So you have a couple of ways of solving this. You can perform a substitution, for instance, x equals omega squared and obtain 0.04 x squared plus x minus 2,500 equals zero, and then solve your quadratic equation and then do the inverse substitution, that is, omega equals square root of x, and you find your four omegas, and only one is going to be uh, an omega good for us, although you're gonna find four values for omega. Most likely two of them are going to be complex conjugate, so definitely you don't want those because omega is a real number, it's just a frequency, the real frequency. But the other method that I want to show you uh, in order to solve this fourth order equation is just a numerical method, uh, which is called the Newton's method. Some of you might already be familiar with that. If not, this is how you do it. So you write your function. So the equation that you want to zero. part of the equation that you want is zero. So it's 0 0.04 omega to the power of four plus omega squared minus 2,500. Then you take the first derivative with respect to omega. And again, having to do with polynomials, it, it is quite straightforward. And then you solve it with iterations. So you have the k plus one iteration terms of omega is equal to the kth iteration minus that function f evaluated at the kth iteration for omega over the derivative evaluated at that. 
the other thing that you want is an estimated initial guess. So you want to start with, with a good estimation for your solution. And we have that because we can just take a look at the plot. We know that the crossover frequency has to be greater than 10. It's quite close to 10. So why don't we use 11 radians per second? Well, if you do so, and then you repeat the Newton's method, you'll see that you're gonna find the first iteration as 18.63, then 16, 0.14, then 15.47. When are you going to end? Well, whenever you find that the next iteration is pretty much the same as the previous one. So I'm going to stop at the fourth one because the fifth is going to be exactly 15.42. So if I want just to retain the, the two decimal places, well, it doesn't really make any difference whether I take the fifth or the fourth iteration. So this means that the crossover frequency is equal to 15.42 radians per second. All right, that's greater than 10, quite close to 10, definitely less than 50. So it looks like it is the right answer. So what is the phase at such frequency? So what is the phase of 50 over I omega c times one plus 0 0.2 i omega c. Well, we have phase associated with 50, it's just zero. And then we have minus arc tangent of omega c over zero, this factor here, which is going to be minus 90. Then minus arc tangent of 0 0.2 omega c over one imaginary part over real part. So we have minus 90 minus 72 which is equal to minus 162 degrees. Therefore, the phase margin is minus 162 plus 180 is 18 degrees, definitely less than 48 degrees. So we do need a compensator. And in fact, we need to add at least 30 degrees of phase at the crossover frequency. But remember that when you're adding a phase lead compensator, you're not just adding a certain amount of phase just at a, at a determinate frequency. You're adding a spectrum a, of, or you're adding, I should say, phase over a spectrum of frequencies. So you have a maximum amount of phase that you can add at your omega m, and then everywhere else is gonna be less than that. However, you also have the fact that you're adding some, and let's go back, when you're, when you're introducing a phase lead compensator, you're adding this tail here, you're adding some high frequency gain, which means that you're raising the magnitude plot. And this will cause the crossover frequency to move to the right because you will cause the overall right tail of the body plot to go up. And so the new crossover frequency, if, you're, if we're adding a lead compensator, will move to the right. So keeping that in mind, you don't want to add exactly 48 degrees at your old crossover frequency. You have to keep in mind that your crossover frequency will move to the right. So it's always a good idea to add some more phase than you actually need. So we actually need 30 degrees if we could add exactly the phase at our old crossover frequency, but that is not possible. So we're gonna add, have to add some more. And here I'm adding 15 degrees. 
but this is really arbitrary. Usually, I would say you can add 10, 20 degrees. If that is not enough, you can add more. Uh, because at the end, you always want to check that your compensated system phase margin meets the requirement. Why not adding 100 degrees then? Well, there's a problem here because the maximum amount of phase that can be realistically added using a single compensator is about 55 degrees. You cannot add or subtract more than 55 degrees. So here, you know, we could add all the way up to 25 degrees as safety margin to get to 55 degrees overall. Uh, let's try with 15. If that happens, that's good. However, keep in mind that there's only 55 degrees at max that you can add using one compensator. If you need to add more than that, then you can use more than one compensator in series. So a cascade of compensators. Okay, so having to design a compensator, mathematically speaking, that means that we have to come up with the values for alpha and tau. What we can do is the following, just to keep things uh, easy. We want to, we know that we're going to add the maximum of our phase at omega m. And omega m is the geometric average between the frequency zero, the zero frequency and the pole frequency. We're going to take that equal to the cross, the old crossover frequency. So we, yes, we're going to add the maximum amount of phase at the old crossover frequency. So we know that omega m is equal to one over tau times square root of alpha. And so let's put this equal to our crossover frequency. And all right, we have a condition, we have one equation, but we have two unknowns, we have tau and alpha. So we need another equation. Well, that is very, uh, it's easy to determine because we also have the maximum amount of phase is given by phi m, that is arc sine of alpha minus one over alpha plus one. And we've determined that the maximum amount of phase to be added is 45 degrees. So from this, we can directly find alpha And so you can find that alpha here is 5.83. We can round it up to alpha equals six, which is a little bit more safety, a more safety factor. And uh, obviously alpha, we have to check that it is greater than one. Since we're dealing with the lead compensator, it is greater than one, so we're good. We have alpha, we have that one over tau times square root of alpha has to be equal to 15.42. And so one over tau square root of six has to be equal to 15.42. That means that tau is equal to 0 0.0265 seconds. Or remembering that sigma p is one over tau, we also have sigma p, and that is 37.74 radians per second. And so we also have alpha t, that is 0 0.1589 seconds. And so we have the frequency associated with the zero, it's just the reciprocal of that. So it's 6.29 radians per second. And so we can write the transfer function for our compensator. We can write it in the frequency domain. Or we can write it in, in the S domain. 
Remember, we need the alpha here. Alpha is equal to six. So we have six times S plus 6.29 over S plus 37.74. So, so the letter way of uh, writing the transfer function is uh, useful if we want to draw the root locus. So now let's draw the compensated body plot and let's see if the phase margin requirement has been met. So here I already have the uncompensated uh, system drawn. I'm gonna go a little bit faster here. Um, however, we already know what's gonna happen. In terms of the magnitude, we're gonna have that, well, a low magnitude, nothing really, sorry, sorry a low frequencies, nothing really changes, but we're gonna have an increase in terms of gain for higher frequencies. And that's the effect of having the compensator. This is just a side effect for a lead compensator. And you see that when we draw the actual compensated body plot, the point at which it intersects the zero decibel line has moved to the right. So we have a shift towards the right when it comes to the crossover frequencies. So the new crossover frequency, which we're gonna call omega C prime, is greater than 15.42 radians per second. And as a matter of fact, we can use MATLAB or you, you could also do it by hand, but just for sake of time, I've used MATLAB to determine that the new crossover frequency is equal to 30.9 radians per second. Now let's see what happens uh, when we have uh, in terms of phase. And this is what really matters because we're using the lead compensator to actively increase the phase. There you go. So you, you clearly see that we've raised the uncompensated phase. And so hopefully now we have enough phase margin to meet the requirement. Now, how do we graphically see the phase margin? We have to first take a look at the new crossover frequency. We've seen it. Here, we've determined it to be 30.9 radians per second. Even if we didn't know the actual value, we can determine graphically where the, the, the new magnitude plot intersects the zero decibel line. We proceed downwards vertically until we meet the phase plot. And then we measure the distance between such point and the minus 180 line. So you see that now we have the new phase margin or the compensated phase margin that is greater than 18 degrees. And in fact, once again, using MATLAB, we can determine that this is equal to 48.3 degrees. Why am I using MATLAB? Because uh, calculations, although doable, uh, become quite uh, cumbersome because we're adding an extra zero, an extra pole. So it's going to become a little bit more complicated. So again, we have determined that the new crossover frequency has shifted towards the right, but now we've met the phase margin requirement and we have a new phase margin that is greater than 48 degrees. So you see that although we've added 45 degrees at the old crossover frequency. If you remember, 
the bump that you would add just for the compensator alone is less to the left and to the right. Here, our new compensated crossover frequency is to the right of, of the old one. So we're going to add effectively less than 45 degrees. We've actually added enough, just barely enough, to meet the requirement. We could have added a little bit more. But remember that if you add more phase, instead of using 45 degrees, you might have added 55 degrees. But you would have shifted the crossover frequency even more towards the right. So just be careful with that. One last thing that I want you to notice is that the, the difference between the high frequency gain is the 20 logarithm of alpha. In this case, alpha is six. So 20 logarithm of six is 15.6 decibels. So we've raised the magnitude at high frequencies of about 16 decibels. So to summarize, in the frequency domain, the phase lead compensator is used to actively increase the phase where needed. So we are actively increasing the phase. As a side effect, we have that the crossover frequency now shifts to higher frequencies, that is to the right. And another side effect that might not be wanted, but that's what happens, is that the high frequency gain increases by 20 logarithm of alpha. So the higher alpha is, the higher this increase in the high frequency gain will be. So the last thing that I want to do is just to, to complete the compensated block diagram by inserting the compensator transfer function. along with our constant gain of 50 used in order to meet the requirements in terms of a steady state error and the original plant five over S times S plus five. So now GC times G where G takes care of also the K is our loop transfer function. Okay, L of S. All right, this is all for today. And next time, we're going to take a look at the very same problem, but we'll try to solve it using a lag compensator. We're going to see a slightly different approach. All right, this is all, and see you virtually next time. Take care.